Yeah, so 2019, I think, was a very successful year. Uh, the results themselves were in line. They were a modest beat. However, I think that, that, that belies the very strong performance. And I think it was a strong performance for a number of reasons. The first one, obviously, was that 2019 was a significant time of uncertainty within the UK. Arguably, it still persists. Perhaps there's a bit more clarity today than there was last year. But nonetheless, during that uncertainty, that, that's not normally good for business. And yet it showed the resilience of our company in terms of uh, continuing to, to grow and meet its strategic goals. And I think the second point, which is uh, very important, is that there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that doesn't come through in any particular year's financial performance, which builds the foundations for the future. And I think last year was very much one of those foundation years. And we've been able to deepen our pipeline. We now have 6,700 bed spaces secured for student accommodation. We now have 2,300 units secured for build to rent development going forward. We've continued to forward sell, giving good visibility of earnings over the next couple of years. And we've continued to get our planning consent, which is meaning our pipeline is coming through appropriately uh, through that development life cycle. So um, on balance, the inline results, which we're very proud of, I think because of those two reasons, uh, really stand us in very good stead and therefore uh, we think they're a very strong set of results. So I think there's a few things about Watkin Jones which puts us in a market leading position. Um, the first thing is that all we do is focus on developing and managing residential for rent within the UK and that has been our singular focus uh, for the last couple of decades. So all of our core, core skill set, all of our expertise leads itself to developing uh, city centre, high rise, high density residential communities. That is the focus of the business. Now of course that is where the biggest opportunity lies in terms of growth going forward with growing demand for more residential for rent both in student and also build to rent but it's certainly an area of skill set and therefore competitive advantage because of the length we've been undertaking that work. I think, I think the second point which is a very important one is that we get a unique and privileged insight into uh, how our consumers are finding our product and the services that we provide uh, on a daily, almost live basis. So we, so through Fresh Property Group, which is the property management business that was set up in 2010, which looks after student accommodation, but also looks after build to rent resi too, um, just under 18,000 tenants being managed on a day-to-day -day basis across the UK. Um, we get significant insight and we're getting direct feedback from consumers about everything, about the product, about the specification, about the layout, about the proposition, i.e. Where, where Fresh are delivering a service, how they actually feel as they're receiving that service, our ability to use digital to make life easier, uh, our sustainability credentials within the buildings themselves, are we doing enough, are there areas we need to do more, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I think having that customer insight is relatively unique as a property developer within the UK, and it does also cement our competitive advantage because surely these thousands or hundreds, hundreds stroke thousands of bits of feedback coming in all the time go directly into the business. We have a specification group who are listening and thinking about how we can evolve what we do and that absolutely goes into the next iteration of our product. Now, our institutional partners, our, our investors absolutely see the benefits of being such a market facing developer that we have current live feedback from the customer, the consumer, in order to make a better product. Uh, for the next iteration and the next generation. So the opportunity we're seeing in residential for rent in the UK is a significant one and it is all about growth. Recent report from Savills is showing that there's about 140 to 150,000 BTR units either developed or in build and they forecast that at maturity the demand for build to rent within the UK could be as much as 1.7 million units. That's an eye-watering number, but nonetheless, it shows the direction of travel of this sector and how quickly uh, people are adopting not just rental within the UK, but also renting uh, in a bespoke, tailor-made 
uh, product which provides amenity and service as well as a fantastic um, uh, apartment as well. Within student accommodation, uh, we have 620,000 uh, built bed spaces for students within the UK, broadly half owned by universities, half owned by uh, corporate providers. Um, we are seeing good growth in that demand, which could increase the uh, demand for new stock by another 300,000 over the top of where we are already. And don't forget it's taken well over 25 years to get to the 600,000 mark. So another 300,000 coming in uh, is a significant growth yet within, within that sector. I think the other, the other point to bear in mind is that over those 25 years plus, um, a lot of student accommodation has been developed. Uh, that student accommodation is clearly much, much older than it was when it was first built. And some of the university owned accommodation uh, was built in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. So we are seeing increasingly the first generation of student accommodation becoming quite obsolescent, not just physically obsolescent, but also just not a space that modern day students want to go and live within. And therefore that creates a lot of regeneration opportunities in addition to that 300,000 growth in headroom. Um, some of the sort of drivers for that growth, rather than just throwing numbers at you, if I, if I, give, you, if I give you a few sort of drivers around it, I think within student accommodation, the big drive here is that UK higher education, so UK universities are ranked globally number two in the world, um, comfortably ahead of, of three and four, and that just generates demand. It generates demand from global um, uh, 18, 19 year olds who want to come and get the best quality education they can get, and that often involves coming to the UK. So we're seeing a big growth in international students. The government wants to see another 130,000 international students studying in the UK by 2030 from where we are today. That completely erases any potential drop from EU students, some EU students who may not continue to come post uh, Brexit. And the other big driver of growth in demand is UK population. That is going to start ticking up quite nicely from 2021, just next year now. Um, and if, if participation rates, i.e. the propensity for A-level leavers to continue to go and study at university holds at 50%, we'll see another 110,000 UK students in the higher education sector by 2030. So those two, 240,000 students, compare that to full-time students of 1.8 million today, potentially 15% growth in the overall sector size uh, by, by 2030. So big inbuilt demand drivers there. Turning to build to rent, What's the big change here? Well, it's all about consumerism. Consumerism is everywhere in the UK. It is yet really to, to find its home appropriately within uh, the private rented sector. BTR is absolutely the solution to consumerism. And what is it? It's about flexibility. It's about service. <clears throat> it's about recognising residential is more than just a built product. It's the amenity and product and services which come around that too. <clears throat> and we're seeing people uh, move into rented uh, in unprecedented scales. So what do I mean by that? Well, since 2000, um, two and a half million more households have been created in the PRS, in the private rented sector. Over the last 10 years, the amount of tenants in England has doubled. Um, and so we're seeing more and more coming into the private rented sector. And we're seeing more and more people alive to consumerism, the fact that they are in charge. We are all in charge of consumers. Um, the old fashioned landlord and tenant um, act, the old tenancy which existed, which puts most of the uh, power and the authority in the in the hands of the landlords. That's a thing of the past. It doesn't exist in build to rent. In build to rent, the, the tenant, the consumer is in charge. They have the flexibility. And I think people are really seeing the value of that over and above living just generally in the private rented sector. So I think the outlook is is positive for us. We have seen structural growth drivers for demand for our product. Uh, we are seeing really strong institutional investor appetite to access build to rent and purpose built student accommodation stock. And of course, coupled, coupled with our track record of working very successfully with those institutional investors in exactly this space, we are in a very good position uh, to be positive about the future and about growth. Now, at the Capital Markets Day, uh, which was hosted on the 5th of November in London, uh, we set out a number of things. But the most important thing we set out was, was a growth opportunity. 
And for all the reasons that we've been discussing just now, for all the reasons that have been set out at the Capital Markets Day and at various updates over the last few uh, months, uh, we're really positive about growth opportunities. And because of it, we have increased our, um, um, we've increased the run rate at which we believe we can develop new stock, both in build to rent and purpose-built student accommodation. For purpose-built student accommodation, we believe we can increase from around 2,700, 2,800 bed spaces per annum, which we've developed this year, last year, and the year before, up to around 3,500 bed spaces per annum uh, from the financial year 23-24. And then within BTR, starting from a very low base, because we are, we've really been focusing our attention into BTR really only over the last uh, two or three years, we're going from a low base and looking, to t looking at, at sort of taking on the opportunity um, of 1,000 BTR units per annum from a similar time frame, which is FY23-24. Now, you might ask why the, why the lag to there, 23-24, from where we are today, which is the start of 2020, and that's purely in the development life cycle. It, it really does take um, six to nine months to secure a site, um, the appropriate site, the right quality and the right location, um, under the right contractual terms and then can take about a 12 month period to secure that planning permission and then the construction will take anything between about 18 months out, out to 30 months subject to the size of it. So there was quite a long lead in gestation period to do it. So actually the opportunity which we're talking about coming through in three or four years time is one we see today but there is just a lead time for us to get to get that, that product that product out there. Um, pleasingly we're looking at funding that growth through um, cash generation which we will do ourselves through our business activities. Currently we, we have a working capital requirement of about 100 million per annum. As we get up to those larger volumes of deliveries we will see that increasing to 150 million but as I say all of that cash required for the growth uh, will be self-generated. So clearly the election result in November from a business perspective having such a decisive majority is really positive and I think it does now slightly change the narrative about the UK into the medium term which is welcome because it's been relatively negative at a macro level since the referendum result in 2016 because of the uncertainty that that was created um, but of course it with that optimism um, could lead to some inflation in input costs. You would expect if demand were to come back in for construction and demand were to come back in for um, land buying, um, you would therefore see natural inflation just as you would do in any marketplace. So the way we're looking at that at the moment is that we are well provided for in terms of bill cost inflation. Uh, typically we would uh, put into all of our appraisals between three and 4% per annum growth in costs and that's built in at the point of underwrite. Um, and I think it's worth noting that last year we saw bill cost inflation at about 2.5% nationally. So we've got, got a nice bit of insulation within our own provisions anyhow. I think <clears throat> alongside that, just, just the way that we operate with our trade packages and our partnering contractors, etc., is that we, we tend to have long-term partnering agreements, which means that we have fixed prices and we have lots of locked-in forward prices. Um, and we tend to have contractual certainty around price with our supply chain. Therefore, uh, within reason, exposure to inflation has been pushed down into our, our supply chain themselves. And then on land inflation, uh, we haven't seen any land price inflation at all. It's probably too early to see that coming through for the moment. But it's worth bearing in mind that, that we buy the vast majority of our sites off market. And what we tend to do is work with owner occupiers or people that own land who want certainty of a transaction and are prepared to trade a little bit on sort of price premium for certainty of a contractual partner who can successfully take their land forward, secure their planning permission, uh, and then at that stage close on the transaction with them. Thank you.